Thank you, Carly. It's really an honor to present the keynote along with fellow artist Brian David Griffith for the Lookout Imagining Futures with Fire series at Oregon State University. I can't imagine a more timely topic. What has gone from seasonal occurrences as recently as Brian and I each started working with the subject of wildfire has become a regular year round phenomenon. We wanna start by recognizing the fire tragedy in Boulder just last week. And with the understanding that the topic may be especially sensitive to some members of the audience. And with all due respect, I believe there's an element of that very sensitivity that is part of what this conversation about art making in response to wildfire is about. What we learn from science and gather from the media can be difficult to distill. Art provides a different point of entry. It engages the senses. It can invite us to ask big questions, look more deeply and reach new conclusions. So I'd like to begin by explaining a little bit about the point of departure for both my work and Brian's that pertains to wildfire. Our initial projects on this topic that we'll share with you tonight came out of the arts and science collaboration, Fires of Change, that was hosted here in Flagstaff, Arizona through Coconino Center for the Arts back in 2015. The model for the collaboration involved, like Carly was saying, 11 artists convening in Flagstaff for what was called a wildfire science boot camp, where we spent a week working alongside fire ecologists, learning about the necessary role of wildfire in Arizona and on the Colorado Plateau, after which we had a year to make new work pertaining to wildfire for a traveling exhibition on the theme. What we found is what deepens the knowledge of the science and also informs the art making is the firsthand experience with fire from visiting wildfire sites firsthand to personal brushes with wildfire catastrophe. We're here to share with you how our, our work pertaining to fire has evolved from these common experiences. Thanks Carly and Julie. Um, like Julie described, uh, my work on fire began back in May 2014. And it really started with two messages, both of which were completely unexpected and out of the blue. First message was from Sean Scavlin, the curator behind Fires of Change, who I didn't know personally beforehand, but he told me the project had just received funding from the National Endowment for the Arts and basically invited me to join the project as a photographer. Now, that's a really rare call to get as an artist, but I said, let me think about it for a week um, because I had a scheduling conflict with another show. And I also do the grant funding wouldn't really be enough to cover my costs on the project. And then just like a few days later, I got the second message, which was a reverse 911 call to prepare to evacuate because the slide fire is burning in Oak Creek Canyon upwind from your neighborhood. Now, all of my film and negatives, so my life's work basically and my livelihood were in that house. And my wife and I were 2000 miles away at an art fair on the East Coast. So we were making calls to Flagstaff, friends and family um, to get things that were important to us out of the house and watching this fire unfold on the national media. Now, the short story is we got lucky with this particular fire, thanks to over a thousand firefighters and a shift in the wind, some past fuel treatments. Remarkably, no lives or structures were lost in the slide fire. But I called Sean Scavlin back and said, hey, count me in because I wanna help rather than feel helpless like I do right now. And if I can't swing a pickaxe in the fire line, then maybe I can use my camera to make work that matters for my community. So those of you here with a connection to science likely understand that regular wildfire cycles are essential for the health of the ecosystem. However, wildfire is frequently accompanied by negative public perception of both wilderness devastation and human disaster. The increased size and severity of recent fires due to suppression strategies that began over a century ago and the continual drought and warming trends resulting from climate change have taken toll on the environment and humans alike.
Well, I came back um, from that boot camp that Julie described, enlightened and inspired, but to be honest, also afraid. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Okay, is that working for everybody? And um, I'm going to show you some past work just so you get an idea of where I was coming from. So remember that I was brought on to the project as a photographer. But the pace of learning there was so intense that I didn't have time or energy to make photos while I was there on site. And I also realized that the photographic ideas I had going in weren't going to work. Um, now, there are a lot of, you know, of really well done dramatic photos of fires and heroic firefighting out there. And that can be great for conveying the magnitude of the problem. But as I saw with the media coverage of the slide fire, contrasted with what I actually saw on the ground afterwards, those kinds of images can also play into our preconceived emotions about fire. Another idea I had was visiting fire sites and photographing the regrowth, the wildflowers, oak shoots, et cetera, which would have been similar to this landscape work. Um, that I've done in the past. But if I did either of those things, I know I would be giving people what they expected. Whereas the power of art for me lies in the unexpected and its ability to reveal a fresh perspective. So I decided the best way to contribute as an artist was to step back and address the underlying cultural perceptions because even where the science is clear, we're never going to implement successful policies until we address those perceptions and get the public on board. But I didn't know how to do that with my camera. I didn't really know how to do that at all. Photography was the only medium I knew how to do before this project. And I was really scared as hell as dropping the ball because I had no good ideas. I was wandering in the wilderness. And then I started asking myself, why am I on this project? I think I'm here to connect with viewers in a different way than scientists can. So what is it that's different about the way an artist sees the world? Well, one day I was walking in the woods with some friends and their son, who was three or four years old at the time. And he came up to me like kids do. And he said, hey, look at this, look at this. And he had in his hand a pine needle. Now we live in a pine forest, so everything is carpeted in pine needles. And of all the things to see on this hike, I started laughing because this kid was obsessed with this pine needle. And so just a few moments later, he came again, hey, look at this, look at this, look at this one. And he held up another pine needle. And then I realized something, which is that me and this child were seeing the world a little bit differently. I was seeing the idea of the pine needle filtered through my learned experience of what is important and what is unimportant. Whereas he was seeing the physical reality of the shape and texture, the raw input of his senses without the judgment of language or symbols. I was seeing as an adult sees, but he was seeing as an artist sees. And when I bothered to notice that fact, I could see that this kid was actually on to something. And as a matter of fact, I went on to make this painting using those pine needles, thanks to him. Now, I want you to think about a work of art that you've seen that gives you a sensation that's hard to describe in words. And I think that's because us artists are trained to tap into our raw sensory input and translate that directly into a work of art without the intermediary of language and symbols. And sometimes that leads us to a depth of human experience beyond what the vessel of language can hold. Now, the problem with talking about an issue like climate change is that it's become politicized. So as soon as people hear familiar language, they dig into their entrenched beliefs and close their minds. So I started thinking, what if I could engage people 
on that visceral sensory level before their preconceptions kick in? What if I could bring burn materials and the power of fire itself into the gallery without the intermediary of a camera or even a paintbrush, yet alone words? Could I open minds that way? And I'm going to show you what I came up with, and you can be the judge of that. So here's the exhibition in Ben. And the first thing that hits you when you walk in the gallery is these massive burn trees and the smell of fire, burn wood, wood that you see here. What you don't see right away is an artist statement. You don't see recognizable images. You don't see any color other than the natural materials. You don't see any direct evidence of my hand as an artist. I want these pieces to seem effortless, like they just grew in place or were left behind like some kind of ancient ruin. And then like being in an ancient ruin, maybe you start to wonder, wait, how did he make that? How are these pieces of wood standing up here without fasteners in the middle of a gallery? And the 2D pieces are the same thing. Like what are these? Are they drawings? Are they paintings? Are they photos? What is going on here? Um, the imagery is nebulous. It's difficult to describe in words. There's not really a great word for it because it's a process I invented. And what I do is I, I coat a panel in beeswax and I hold that over a fire until the wax is soft, trapping the carbon in the smoke and the wax. Again, my intent with all this is to draw you in and pique your curiosity, to connect at that visceral level first. Now there is an accompanying label with each piece, and it's usually a quote from a scientist about the issue that inspires it, but it gives a lot of, it leaves a lot of ambiguity for you to discover the work itself. Now, on this label, for instance, we learned that historically, fire in this ponderosa pine forest came along every five to 15 years on average. And it took the small, but spared the big trees. Not only are those big trees more fire resistant, but the structure of that historical forest, which is mixed in age and density. So there's clumps and, and breaks in the canopy. That structure is more fire resilient as well. Then the first loggers came along and did the opposite. They took the big and left the small. Without fire to thin them out, those small trees grew in today's, into today's ponderosa forest, which is younger, it's denser, it's more homogenous, and it's less drought resistant than historical forests. So in these dry forests, each fire put out is just a fire put off. In other words, we're just banking more fuel until a fire finally escapes containment, which almost always happens during extreme weather when it's at its most destructive. So as a result, the fires over on this side of the installation have grown from frequent low severity fires to these high severity fires in the foreground, capable of killing everything, including the oldest and biggest trees. I worked with firefighters to collect those small diameter logs from an actual thinning project. And the slide fire that I mentioned previously was where I got the burn pieces from, as well as Schultz fire, which is a higher severity fire in Flagstaff. Now, eventually in the exhibition, you do get to the artist statement about a third of the way in. And that's where I talk about those cultural perceptions that I mentioned. Which is that I think we have a long history of seeing fire as an evil that can be eradicated, as a battle between life and death. And we're the good guys fighting to preserve life and prevent death by fighting wildfires. But I think we're learning that life and death, forest and fire, are part of one continual process of succession. One can't exist without the other. 
Many native species we know now are adapted to depend on fire or the diversity of habitat it creates. So by trying to prevent death for the last hundred years, we have inadvertently severed that cycle of life. And now wildfire is coming back with a vengeance like a river breaching a dam. And there are a lot more houses in that proverbial floodplain than there used to be. In the last 30 years, residential developments have replaced farms, replaced ranches, and encroached dramatically in the fire prone landscapes. And this increases ignitions due to the additional power lines, vehicles, human activity. And it makes both land management and firefighting far more complex and a lot more expensive than they were 30 years ago. Now, many of my forms you'll see here use broken circles and broken lines like this piece. This is one of the pieces from the original fire change project. There are three pieces. And um, that is for me is a metaphor for these natural cycles being disrupted by human interference. Here's another one of the original pieces. And here you see basically a two-dimensional version of the same shape I showed you before. So it just alludes to that disruption of fire cycle of life and death, um, which tree ring studies show happened here in Flagstaff shortly after white settlement in the 19th century with the advent of large scale commercial overgrazing, removal of the timber here. Um, and in Arizona, um, the land was actually parceled out along this checkerboard grid into state, federal and private land. Um, regardless of natural topography. And if you fly over with an airplane, you can actually see this checkerboard pattern due to differences in land management. This was the first piece I made to incorporate wood into a painting like this. And it was originally going to have a historic saw blade with the teeth kind of coming out of the wall here. And right before the show opened, I decided I really wasn't quite happy with it. I wanted something more organic, but I didn't know quite what to use. And then I remembered I did have one piece of wood in my garage, and it was actually backside to the mantle, which is above my head here in this picture. And it just happened to fit perfectly in that place. I put it in right before the show. There you can see it. Um, and that mantle was actually a gift to me from a friend who moved to Ben. So when I opened this show in Ben, I brought him into the gallery and said, hey, you recognize that piece of wood? That's the backside of that mantle piece. And if you hadn't given that to me, I probably would have never come up with the idea to put the wood in the painting like that. So there is one photograph in the show. And it's a piece I added later called The Impermanence of Forest. Here it is installed a couple of years ago in the Phoenix Art Museum. Um, it's shot on film. It's printed on this really thin gossamer silk and, uh, and then burned. So it's a photo of a burning forest, but then at its base here are ashes from the actual scene depicted. So I went back to that fire afterwards and gathered the remains of what you see in the photo are actually below it, as well as pieces of the photo itself. Now, when we think about forests on a human time scale, these trees and forests, they seem ancient, they seem lasting, they seem stable, like stone. But when you talk, you know, when you view it on this time scale of the forest itself, which is hundreds of years, um, forests are living, breathing, constantly changing in cyclical patterns of succession, in which fire plays a really important role. Now, I don't know about you, but I definitely grow attached to the forests that I know. And I wanna keep them in that beautiful state indefinitely. But I've come to realize that change is necessary for all life. If you try to hold anything living in stasis, it cannot continue to live. Here you see the same piece in Ben, the impermanence of forest there. Now, throughout this body of work, you'll see me juxtaposing lightness, darkness, 
and these um, organic lines with soft natural edges with geometric forms that reflect the intersection of the natural and the man-made environments and convey our desire to control capricious natural processes, sometimes successfully, sometimes with unintended consequences. Now, as, as you all know better than I, the fires of 2020 profoundly affected Oregon and displaced thousands of people. So when I brought this show here to Bend, I wanted to acknowledge the loss and suffering that so many had experienced. But I really struggled with how to do that. And then one day I was doing an experiment with maple leaves, with wax and fire. And the piece I was trying to make failed miserably um, and it, it led on fire. But then I noticed there is something arresting about the undersides of the maple leaves and the way they had charred. And it reminded me of the charred leaves that had rained down intact um, in my yard in Flagstaff during the fire. Each one was unique. It's like a snowflake or a handprint. And that gave me an idea. So I carved this monolith in my studio. And then when I came to Oregon for the show, I spent an extra day visiting the Sandium fire site where it burned near Detroit Lake and collecting materials to incorporate into the installation. So here's what I came up with um, over here. So this installation, it serves as a memorial for the 2020 fires. And each of these charred leaves commemorates a life lost. But it's also a tribute. It's a tribute to those who worked tirelessly to prevent a much larger loss of life. And a testament to all those who suffered through loss and emerged on the other side. One day I was out for a hike and I came upon an aspen tree that had blown over in the wind. And then I remembered this burn scar we had visited back in the boot camp where acres of these golden aspen leaves had flickered in the sun above the char remains of what had been a mixed conifer forest in the North Rim of the Grand Canyon. And I learned there that aspens sprout from underground rhizomes following a, a fire that's severe enough to kill the parent tree. Um, but since they already have these established root systems, the new suckers grow quickly and they outcompete other species that have to grow from seed. So um, aspen really thrive after a fire. So here you have thousands of aspen leaves and they're rising up from this broken circle of wildfire debris or burn conifers. Um, and hopefully this looks really effortless, but like a lot of my work to make it look effortless actually takes a lot of effort behind the scenes. And so when I found that tree, I, I filled my backpack up with leaves and I went home and I was really excited. I didn't know exactly what I was gonna do, but I knew I was gonna some kind of suspended shape. And, but I had to figure out a way to preserve the leaves. So I dipped them all in beeswax and then they all just turned brown. And so I was all right, well, maybe I need to dry them out first. That makes sense. So I, I dried them and pressed them between cardboard like I've done with lots of other leaves. But then when I went to dip those ones in wax, they had also mostly turned brown. So I brought out my food dehydrator and I put the leaves in there. And then they turn brown like right away. So I emailed a friend of mine that works, that makes two dimensional art out of leaves and told him what I was doing. He's like, well, aspen leaves are like one of the hardest leaves to preserve. They almost always turn brown. Um, but uh, if I were you, I'd do something different. Let me know if you find a way. And uh, now I'm getting a little worried because the thing with natural materials is you can't just go get them whenever you want. And the fall leaf change was getting to an end and I already promised this installation. I was so excited about the idea to a museum that winter. 
Um, so I went out and my wife helped me and we gathered thousands more aspen leaves knowing that some of them are going to fail. And I also gathered a bunch of maple leaves in case it didn't work. Um, and we found a way to, to make it work. I thought about, okay, what's the heat and the pressure that tends to make them more brown? So maybe if I got rid of all the heat and all the pressure, I might have a chance. And so I laid them out in my garage, which was really cold and dry in trays, and that worked. Um, we still had about a third of them turn brown, but enough to make the installation. Now, I didn't use the maple leaves, but if I hadn't collected the maple leaves, I wouldn't have come up with the idea for a previous installation. Now, you can see the leaves, and you know, by drawing them this way, they curled more. But I think that actually works as far as making it more convincing. So sometimes you discover things by working with the materials that you don't that aren't obvious when you're thinking about it in your head. The other thing you can't quite see here is that this piece is activated by a viewer, meaning that as you walk by it, the wind currents from you walking around causes leaves to flicker and flutter in the wind, just like a real aspen leaf does. I really like the idea of, I think if, you know, a viewer is required to complete the art. So you see a lot of my forms that they're those broken circles and or, or lines and your mind wants to complete that shape. And so that's another way to draw the viewer in. But, you know, I'm telling you a lot of things about the work and what it means and what my intention is. But I think there's a risk there of telling you too much and precluding your own discovery. I definitely have an intention, but there's, there's more than one way to interpret these pieces and the way that you interpret them, what makes sense for you is a valid interpretation. Just as Julie and I, as you'll see, took the same information and made completely different art about it, you can interpret my work differently. I think people get intimidated by contemporary art, especially more abstract art, because they think it all is supposed to have some kind of pretentious hidden meaning and that you're stupid if you don't figure it out. And that's not how it should be at all, in my mind. For me, good art uh, can be like visiting Chaco Canyon or Stonehenge. Now, I don't need to know what the creators of those places intended, and I don't know what they intended, to have a profound experience there. Because art is not a puzzle to figure out. It's a greater mystery to be in awe of. It can be a mirror to your soul. It can be a window to possibility in the wider world. And I hope my art can be a vehicle for discovery. I see my role as an artist. I think my role is to provoke questions. It is not to choose solutions for you. I try to create a charged atmosphere here in the gallery where you can spark your own discoveries, which are sometimes different than my own. Now I'd like to hand it back over to Julie and you'll see what she created with the same information. Thank you, Brian. Um, Brian, I think you're going to need to end your screen share. Thank you. All right, I'm just gonna show you a couple examples of my work, two different projects that pertain to wildfire, um, starting with um, oops. starting with, sorry, this one. Okay, starting with Ashes to Ashes, which is the, um, the project Carly referenced in the introduction that was inspired by the Fires of Change uh, Arts and Science collaboration. So Ashes to Ashes is a series of drawings depicting recent Arizona wildfires. Um, rendered with charcoal samples that I collected from each fire site. So each drawing is displayed then with its corresponding charcoal sample, as you can see here. And the collection represents again, 14 significant wildfires from 1990 to the present with archived photographs used as references for the imagery. So the depicted wildfires were selected in consultation with the fire scientists who participated in the Fires of Change project. 
The significance of these wildfires was not necessarily in their size nor scope, but rather that the scientists deemed that something important could be learned from them toward the future of fire ecology and wildlife management strategies. The presentation of the drawings includes, as you can see here, the pertinent fire statistics for each wildfire. So the incident type, cause, date, location, acreage, veg vegetation, management style, and structures and lives lost if applicable. Pair with a uh, paired with the corresponding charcoal sample, I think there's an element of artifact that then grounds the image in a particular time and place. To create the drawings, I visited each wildfire site statewide to collect the charcoal samples and also to have a firsthand experience with the site. I think there's a sense of integrity behind the work in the process, collecting the charcoal and becoming personally connected with the place. It was also important to me to include fires that had impacted me personally and my community. This drawing depicts the Dosi fire of 2013. This fire occurred within a mile of my home and studio at the time, which bordered the Prescott National Forest where I lived at the time and forced my temporary evacuation. And this then is the Yarnell Hill fire. Just two weeks after Prescott's Granite Mountain hotshot crew successfully fought the Dosi fire, 19 members of the crew were killed in the Yarnell Hill fire just 20 miles away. So fire holds emotional significance to the many communities that have experienced loss of life or property due to wildfires. And I think for the viewer, just knowing that, that this work is created from the ashes of perceived disaster, that there's a physical connection between the image that you look at and the place that it represents. It becomes a visceral experience that reaches the emotions. In the larger Fires of Change collaboration, the objective was for fire scientists to engage with artists in order to reach a wider audience and to consider and interpret the science behind wildfire. Of course, the art doesn't necessarily provide the answers. We rely on science for that, but it definitely opens the mind to the questions. I made this piece, the, Catal the Catalina Rincon Panorama and a research co collaboration with the University of Arizona Laboratory of Tree Ring Research in Tucson. The image again is rendered with wildfire charcoal that I collected from each wildfire site across two adjacent mountain ranges outside of Tucson. Keeping in mind that wildfire doesn't necessarily conveniently line the roadway, this took several excursions and hikes into deep wilderness in the Catalina Mountains over Rincon Pass in the Rincon Mountains. Um, and I was guided uh, by staff from the tree ring lab as well as um, working with the staff to, to um, find GPS points for specific fires that were significant to the region. And on that note, I'm looking forward to um, working with the Oregon State University students in the class on Thursday, we'll, we'll, where we'll talk more about that collaborative element. So again, in this piece, the charcoal samples used to create the drawing are displayed in proximity to each wildfire site. Here, the GPS points are also designated along with the charcoal samples. And the density of charcoal in the drawing reflects the relative frequency and severity of wildfires in recent history. So the Santa Catalina Mountains are Tucson's most prominent range with the highest peak of the Sky Islands on Mount Lemmon. The inhabited areas of the mountain include Summer Haven and Sabino Canyon. This is the left panel of the, of the diptych panorama. And this, the Rincon Mountain, the right panel, by comparison, peaks approximately nearly a thousand feet lower on Rincon Peak and uninhabited, the wilderness remains remote despite its close proximity to Tucson. And herein lies the disparity that serves as the basis for this drawing. From a bystander's perspective, the Santa Catalina Mountains appear green, the image on the left. 
The higher elevation range allows for a diversity in the vegetation ranging from saguaro cactus to aspen forests. Due to human inhabitation, fires are suppressed. This results in dense, ve dense, veg uh, dense vegetation capable of producing high severity mega fires. The Rincon Mountain Wilderness, pictured on the right, on the other hand, appears brown. At a lower elevation, the ecosystem ranges from desert chaparral to ponderosa pine. Since this is uninhabited wilderness, naturally occurring wildfires are permitted to take a natural trajectory. Vegetation is re reduced through regular wildfire cycles, so fires are typically smaller and more manageable. So ironically, while the Santa Catalina appear to be the healthier of the two mountains, it's the Rincon wilderness that is the more sustainable environment. So as you can see, while my work is quite different from Brian's in scope and medium, we share the common objective of aiming to reverse the public perception trajectory as viewers gain a renewed appreciation for the necessity of wildfire towards sustaining the longevity of our shared landscape. Brian, back to you. Yeah, thanks, Julie. Um, it's a great presentation. And um, I'll just say, you know, part of my reason for showing you kind of how I got lost in the wilderness to wait is to kind of to, for all those students out there, artists, activists, wherever you come from that are concerned about the problems that we face in this generation. Just, just to let you know that, you know, with problems so big, it can seem hard to know where to start. And there's nothing so intimidating as staring at a blank piece of paper trying to save the world. So as you see from my presentation, you know, my own path to making art, it's been a long perilous meander through the wilderness, one small step at a time. But in the end, fire really transformed my art practice and my life in ways I never anticipated. So if I've learned a lesson to share, it's this, that your initial direction is less important than taking the first step and beginning the journey. Taking action begets action. It puts the gears of innovation in motion and momentum on your side. The important thing is not that you succeed on your first step, but that you keep learning and adapting through the next steps and persist, persist, persist until the end. We are all capable of more than we realize, and we find the courage to stand up, try, and persist. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both so much. Um, and Brian, that really leads into the first audience question that we got. And so I can put that out to both of you um, and audience, um, everybody out there, you're welcome to put your questions in the Q&A box and we'll get to as many of those as you can. Um, so someone wrote um, that I love your art as a catalyst for social change and is wondering who your intended audience is and what they can do. Um, and, and Brian, you kind of started in on that. So maybe Julie, if you wanna start um, in response to that. Sure, um, for all of my art making, it's really important to me that my work reaches a broad um, audience that, is, that goes beyond um, perhaps the typical museum or gallery audience. And I think, um, the, the messages or stories I try and convey um, are uh, a, a catalyst for that level of engagement. So part of my work is about, um, you know, narrative and representational imagery, yet using um, different types of materials to, again, provide that sort of visceral relationship with, with the work. Um, so I think, you know, I think we're, we're really drawn to the history of pictures. So to land relevant pictures at this place in this moment in time um, is, a, is a great way to, to engage new audiences and invite a larger conversation or narrative to go from there. Brian, is there anything that you wanna to add to that? I know your connection is a little 
bit unstable. So I, I know you were going to turn off video if that happens. So I am imagining that's what's going on there. Um, um, yes, I can, I can bring it back on here. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, the, I mean, with the audience, it's interesting because the High Desert Museum isn't just an art museum. Um, so there are families there, there are children there. And in my last show in the Fresno Art Museum, I know they had over 6,000 um, school age kids come through and see the exhibit. And a lot of them are really into it, um, more than I expected, because I think my work is pretty esoteric. You know, it's kind of hard to know what's going on, but it's architecturally interesting the way that it's in that museum space. And I think connecting at that visceral level, like I learned from children, hopefully I'm able to connect with them. And for me, that's really exciting. And I think a message that I, that hopefully they get out of this show is that, you know, you don't have to have a lot of, or I don't have a formal art degree. Um, and the materials I use are just things I find in the forest for the most part, um, other than white paint. Um, and so you can make art from any background with any materials and you can make it authentically by using the materials that are around you. For me, it's things that are found in the forest. For somebody in the city, maybe it's chain link and brick and things like that. You know, whatever is there, anything can be an art material and anyone can be an artist. Thank you. Um, we have quite a few questions. Um, maybe I, I'll try to combine a, a couple here. Um, I, some of them are about um, how you engaged with scientists in your work. And um, Brian, you had this quote that you came back from this boot camp enlightened and inspired, but also afraid <laughs> um, after I assume being sort of immersed in, in so much information. Um, so what was that experience like um, being in the field with scientists and, and how did that shape um, how you approached your work? Yes. Um... I guess the main thing was, I mean, they're, they're subject matter experts, right? So they have um, kind of a jargon and um, a lot of information. So part of my role is to, like even in the science exhibit that I, that I have there, there's, there's quotes from scientists that go with the pieces if you go to the museum exhibit. And part of my role is, is taking what they say and then working with them to kind of get it more concise and in common language that ordinary people can understand. Um, and then the other thing is like, the workshop was just so intense because they threw so much information at us. They described it as like a semester or more of forestry in a week's time. And as artists, we kind of need some space to just get hands on with the materials. So I, I don't, the, what kind of scared me is I had all this academic information coming from me, almost like a lecture, even though I was visiting a site, but I didn't have time to actually a lot of time to go out and touch and feel and smell and things like that. And that those that's really important for an artist. And that's a different way that we engage the world. Um, I'll hand it back over to Julie here. Yeah, thanks, Brent. Yeah, to expand on that a little bit, I think what was successful about these particular collaborations, so the Fires of Change project and also the work I did with the University of Arizona Laboratory of Turing Research, is that the science, the scientists involved truly understood the nature of the project. So there was no expectation that as artists we were to illustrate their models or ideas. That's the scientific illustration is its own field. Um, um, it's specifically towards the, a very um, deliberate specific uh, level of communication. It's another field I'm quite interested in, but this art making was a departure from that. So, um, so the, the scientists were there to relay as much pertinent information as they felt, and then certainly a sounding board for all of our questions. And, um, you know, I think the scientists also understood the, the objective of these projects was that um, there's a limitation um, that the scientists found to getting their information out to the public. And that was one of the roles we had as artists to be like, you know, this, this is our way of interpreting this information. And so what are now let's introduce to the audience that they might um, have a different, different approach to um, digesting the information and, and reinterpreting them themselves. So I think what we provide is an invitation for um, um, a general audience to engage in pretty complex subject matter otherwise. That was exactly what I 
we wanted to say and couldn't think of saying, Julie. So good job. Yeah. The main thing is, you know, it, we have to have, in order for the art to be exhibited and for us to be interested in making it, it has to stand on its own as contemporary art, apart from the science issue. And, and the, the scientists we work with understood that because they were trying to reach a different audience. And the other thing is we have to be able to interpret um, things as we will, as long as it's not inaccurate, including criticizing the scientists. And they were also open to that. Well, it sounds like a really incredible art science collaboration. Um, what an honor to be part of that. Um, uh, you both talked about um, your sort of part of your work as artists is for the potential for people to be changed when they see your work and engage with your work. And um, one of our audience members is, is asking a similar question of you. Um, did your ideas or emotions towards your project change when you reached the wildfire sites? Um, and if so, how did that change your work? Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that. Um, I think one of the most, um, the, the biggest takeaways I had from that experience was being introduced to the real necessary role of wildfire in our environment, the necessity for, you know, um, you know, humans have impacted the forest beyond repair. So the necessity of prescribed burning to try and revert them to a more natural growth cycle. Um, um, just seeing firsthand like what a ponderosa pine would look like had it not been um, prevented from burn cycles over the years and the size different. And so again, it was the firsthand experience seeing core samples come out of the trees, um, seeing the fire scars within those that represented burn cycles over X number of years and they stop, right? So, so just, um, and I think it's that too, that's the firsthand experience that in itself was a visceral, it was very visual, it was sculptural in nature. So it was a, a natural, um, I think the collaboration with the arts just came naturally out of all of those firsthand examples and it just in addition to the the coursework on top of it. Um, yeah, Brian. Um, one thing that was surprising to me that I, I didn't quite plan on was kind of understanding what the role of a of a land manager and a, and a firefighter who's making the decisions for what's going on with the fire on what their job is like, because there's a real tendency to kind of armchair quarterback them, um, especially with the benefit of hindsight. And so understanding that they're making really difficult decisions and they're looking at when they're deciding what to do with a fire, what the weather is gonna be, what the fuel situation is on the ground, how dry is it? And also what's the availability of other crews based on what other fires are going on at the same time. So it's a really difficult job. And, um, and that information is changing underneath them as they're making those decisions. And so it gave me a lot more sympathy for them and a lot, a lot more realization that a lot of times the decisions that maybe in hindsight look like, okay, maybe this fire got out of control or whatnot, they were making what was the right decision, the best decision they could on the ground at the time. Yeah, thanks for that. And it seems like that those decisions are getting more and more complicated um, every every season, if we can even call them fire seasons anymore. Um, and that question leads into maybe our last question of the evening. So um, everybody can we can wrap up um, right at seven o'clock. But um, one of the questions that we're asking with this series or one of the things that we want to explore is how can we better take care of each other in this era of mega fires, take care of each other and the land. And you both live in fire prone areas. Um, can you talk a little bit about what changes you've made to your lives or to the way that you are in your community um, given what has really become um, a, a deep knowledge of fire for you over the years and this, this long engagement with wildfire? Yeah, um, that's a that's a big question. Um, we all have, you know, personal relationships. My home community here in Flagstaff was the 
the street I live on was the epicenter of the museum fire and the subsequent flooding that was um, in national news this last summer. So as a neighborhood, we, we help each other out sandbagging and things. But, you know, I think on some level, um, it's also a recognition and on some level an acceptance of the fact that we've bumped our neighborhood right up against the national forest. It's a gorgeous place to live. And um, the fact that fire, fire, that wildfire is a fact of nature, um, you know, we, we're setting ourselves up in beautiful spaces to just be on the front lines of that sort of catastrophe. And that's a decision and a choice. Obviously, human impact and climate change have, has exacerbated the situation. So just being really proactive about, you know, I mean, the basics of, you know, keeping yard debris um, you know, handled and things like that. I think we're all all on board with that as part of the community. But yeah, it's a it's a it's a bigger question about um, what our own personal level of engagement is in our our landscape. Thanks. Yeah, I definitely. I mean, I made some changes to to our property one to try to make it a little more. Firewise, and I just want to put out there, um, you know, people sometimes think of that being like, oh, I'm going to have to cut all my trees down. I'm going to have to have, you know, my yard be zero scape or, or, or gravel. And that's not true at all. We have, you know, 20 or so mature trees on my property. And we didn't have to take any of them down. They are reasonably well spaced. We did limb up some of the trees. Um, and we did take out a bunch of juniper shrubs that were near the house. And I replaced that with a garden right up in front of the house. And um, so, so you can do that and it's really more enjoyable than those, those juniper shrubs were. And it's thinking of, you know, is that gonna stop a fire like a slide fire from burning down my house? No, have you ever seen a fire site? You see that wood frame houses are even better fuel for fire than the forest is. Um, but can it help uh, me and my neighbors if you know an, an ember were to come in from an adjacent fire and all yes it makes it more defensible um but it's also you know feel makes me feel more connected to the landscape understanding that understanding the plants native plants that i have in my garden has introduced me to gardening so you know you do things and you don't know how it's going to affect your life and it's also i think julie um played into this a bit but Again, it's made me a little sympathetic for the decisions that other people are making there. And I think one thing that, that keeps, um, that kind of stands in the way of progress on fire is this tendency to blame, find who's to blame for starting the fire. When in reality, some of these things are really, the systemic problems are what are really more important. And the ignition is gonna come at some time. It's just happened to come at this particular time. And realizing that, having some sympathy for those that are fighting the fires, making these decisions, realizing they're difficult decisions and realizing that we are all complicit in those systemic problems. I live in an older house, but it is near the national forest. So I'm complicit. I drive a car and a truck to transport my work that burns fossil fuel, does contribute to climate change. So uh, I think we're all complicit. Well, we thank you um, for all of your contributions and for exploring these, these tough questions with us um, and, and for your incredible work. We look forward to the work that you do in the future, um, both on wildfire and whatever else um, is next for you. And um, we will put your, um, your sites in the chat so that people can check out um, the other work that you've done. Uh, and, and find out what's, what's next for you. Um, so thank you both so much um, for helping us to kick off the series um, and begin to explore these questions. And thanks to all of you who joined us this evening and tuned in. Um, we'll be posting this talk um, on Spring Creek Project's YouTube channel in the next few days. And so you are welcome to revisit it uh, or share it um, freely with other folks who might not have been able to attend this evening. I look forward to um, seeing you, your names at least, um, in, in future uh, Tuesday evening talks. Um, and so thanks so much and take good care and have a nice evening.